Well, I know people may be joining us, but I'd like to begin today's webinar. Um, so let's go ahead and um, publish the results of today's poll. So uh, it looks like we have um, a few CTE instructor, a guidance counselor, um, some school administrators um, or district and state, and then um, many of us who fall into the other category. So we're so glad you're here. If you, again, want to begin um, this webinar by introducing yourself in, your in the chat box, it's always fun to see who's joined us and from which states. Um, so welcome. We're so glad that you're taking part of your day to join us. Um, so welcome to this webinar put on by Regional Educational Laboratory or RHEL Midwest, uh, increasing the reach of career and technical education. This webinar is being recorded. The American Institutes for Research, AIR, allows for the recording of audio, visuals, participants and other information sent, verbalized or utilized during business related meetings. By joining a meeting, you automatically consent to such recordings. Any participant who prefers to participate via audio only should disable their video camera so only their audio will be captured. Video and or audio recordings of any AIR session shall not be transmitted to an external third party without the permission of AIR. I know we're all very familiar with Zoom settings for now, by now, but I'd just like to briefly highlight that you're welcome to join today's webinar um, by clicking on the audio button on the bottom of your platform. You have the option to dial in to the phone line or to listen through computer audio. You can click on the chat box to ask questions of the presenters um, as they're sharing their information or to let us know about any technical issues. We also have closed captioning available and for that you'll just click on the CC button um, in that same lower bottom section of your pane. We have a great series of experts who are joining us on today's call. Um, I'm pleased that I'm joined by uh, two senior researchers from RHEL Midwest. Dr. Megan Austin and Dr. Jean May Wan. They'll be presenting on a recent Realm Midwest study about CTE in Minnesota and Indiana. We also have Troy Hogan, Director of College and Career Readiness at Lakes Country Service Cooperative in Minnesota to give his on the ground practitioner perspective on CTE. Here is an overview of the agenda for today's webinar. Uh, I'm going to give a brief overview of RHEL Midwest to introduce you to our work. Um, then we'll have a presentation of a recent RHEL Midwest study, characteristics and outcomes for Indiana and Minnesota high school students who focused on career and technical education. And then that'll be followed by Troy's uh, remarks and perspective on CTE, followed with a, by a question and answer session. And again, you're welcome to add questions or comments for our presenters throughout today's webinar and we'll try to address as many as we can during that question and answer session. So just a brief overview of RHEL Midwest. Next slide, please. Regional Educational Laboratory or RHEL Midwest is part of a network of 10 regional educational laboratories funded by the US Department of Education's Institute of Education Sciences or IES. Uh, Robin West serves seven Midwest states, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Michigan, Minnesota, Ohio, and Wisconsin. Uh, to address the priorities and interests of these states, RHEL Midwest supports five research partnerships in a networked improvement community, as well as other collaborations. The work of these partnerships is developed in consultation with state education agency and district staff to address priority issues in the region. And I see in the chat box, we have a link to our website, so you can click over there to learn more as well. We offer a variety of types of support, including applied research studies, like the one being highlighted on today's webinar, as well as technical support and coaching, and our Ask a Rail annotated bibliography service. Um, again, we encourage you to click over to our website to learn more about these activities and explore them more. Finally, today's webinar is being developed in partnership with our Midwest Career Readiness Research Alliance. Um, this research alliance focuses on improving college and career readiness in Minnesota using research and data. Um, and we've done a number of projects um, and activities in Minnesota related to CTE. Uh, we have the report focused on uh, the post-secondary pathways of CTE students in Indiana and Minnesota, 
We've also done a training for high school counselors in these states, um, focused on helping CTE students choose their post-secondary pathways and have a documentary called Ready to the Future, which highlights hands-on programs that help students develop, develop career skills. Um, so again, uh, we invite you to uh, click on the link in the chat box to learn more about the Career Readiness Research Alliance and the body of work that we have. And with that, I'm happy to pass it over uh, to Megan and Jimei. Thanks, Emily. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, it's great to be with you today. Uh, Yimei and I are pleased to be here to share an overview with you of our recent study of Indiana and Minnesota students who focused on career and technical education in high school. Um, I uh, want to first acknowledge the larger study team uh, pictured here. Jim Lindsay was our other principal investigator and we were supported by two great analysts, Jing Tong Pan and Max Pardo. Uh, this was really a true team effort to coordinate data from two states and to conduct um, parallel analyses that also took into account each state's unique CTE context. So I'll briefly introduce, um, we looked at four research questions for this study, uh, which came out of a request uh, initially from stakeholders in uh, Indiana from the Commission for Higher Education, who expressed to us interest in better understanding um, each of these questions. So we started by examining the percentage of high school graduates uh, in each state who were CTE concentrators, explorers, samplers and non-participants, and I'll share a detailed definition of each of these categories momentarily. Um, then we examined what student and high school background characteristics were associated um, with high school graduates enrollment in and completion of uh, CTE courses in each of these categories. And then finally, we conducted two sets of causal analyses. Um, first, examining the effect of taking and completing CTE courses in high school on graduates' college enrollment and graduation outcomes. And second, um, examining the effect of uh, being a CTE concentrator or explorer on high school graduates' employment and earnings. We use the same data to answer all four research questions, but different methods depending on the question, and I'll describe each of these uh, in turn briefly. So first, in both states, we combine data across state agencies and across multiple years. Uh, the K-12 data included student courses taken, demographic characteristics, uh, grade eight achievement test scores, which we used as background, and then uh, characteristics of students' high schools. The post-secondary data included our um, key college outcomes, including enrollment, graduation, um, progress in college in terms of credits earned for Minnesota specifically, and then we also were able to use um, National Student Clearinghouse data to capture uh, these outcomes for students who were not attending public uh, colleges and universities in each of the states. And then our um, employment data included employment uh, within each of the states and then quarterly wages for those who were employed in each state. To address the first research question, we tabulated the percentage of students in each of four categories of CTE participation. These are the concentrators, explorers, samplers, and non-participants that I mentioned earlier. Uh, the two states define these categories somewhat differently, and we used each state's specific definition that was in place during the years of study. So in Indiana, concentrators were those who completed at least six semester credits in a single CTE pathway. Explorers completed at least six semester credits in CTE, but did not reach that six credit threshold in any specific pathway. Samplers completed, completed fewer than six semester credits in CTE, and non-participants completed no credits in CTE. In Minnesota, um, concentrators were defined as those who completed at least 150 hours, which was about two semesters in a CTE career field. Explorers were those who completed at least 150 hours, but not um, at least 150 hours in any specific field. Um, samplers completed more than uh, one hour, but fewer than 150 hours in CTE. And non-participants were those who received no instruction in CTE. Um, to address the second research question, we uh, examined 
the background characteristics of high school graduates. Um, so these are student characteristics as well as uh, characteristics of their high schools. Um, and we cross tabulated those uh, characteristics with each of the four CTE classification uh, groups. And then with our partners, we identified a threshold of five percentage points or larger as uh, considered a meaningful difference between categories. And then to address research questions three and four, we used a matching method that allowed us to make causal inferences about the effects of being a CTE concentrator rather than a sampler or a non-participant. And similarly, the effects of being a CTE explorer rather than a sampler or a non-participant. Um, so this matching process uh, match concentrators with samplers and non-participants who were similar to the concentrators on many background characteristics that we were able to observe in the data, um, but differ just in terms of their, their CTE classification status. Uh, and then we did the same thing for explorers, uh, matching to similar uh, samplers and non-participants. And then for this research question, we looked at multiple college outcomes related to enrollment, uh, college or college credits earned, and then certificate or degree completion. And then to address research question four, we use the same matched comparison groups I, I described previously, and I uh, use those groups to examine employment and earnings for the match groups in each of the first five years after high school. I'll turn it over to Yin Mei now, and she's gonna share some of our findings with you. Thanks, Megan. Um, hello, everybody. This is Yin Mei Wan, and I'm a senior researcher at AR, and I have happy to highlight some of the key findings from the study. So research question one asked about what percentage of high school graduates were uh, CD concentrators, explorers, samplers, and non-participants. Uh, we found that uh, Indiana and Minnesota showed different patterns of uh, CTE participation over time. The graph on the left shows that participation in CTE among Indiana graduates increased over time. The percentage of concentrators increased from 15% in 2013-14 uh, to 28% in the 27-18 cohort. CTE participation in Minnesota, however, remained consistent over time as is shown in the chart on the right, uh, nearly half, a little less than half of students uh, who graduate from high schools between 2013 and 2018 were concentrators. And the percentage of graduates in the other three categories also remained stable during this period of time. Uh, so research question two examines what background uh, student and school characteristics are associated with being a CTE concentrator. Um, we found uh, that CTE participation is associated with school geographic locale. In both states, graduates in urban and suburban areas were less likely to concentrate in a CTE field, whereas uh, they were more likely to be non-participants than their uh, graduates uh, in schools that located in towns and rural areas. We also found that in both states, there were several uh, student characteristics that are associated with city participation. Male grad graduates were more likely to be concentrators than female graduates, and graduates who received special education services were more likely to be concentrators than graduates who didn't uh, receive any special education services, and also graduates who were not proficient reading in grade eight, that, that is before they enter high school, uh, were more likely to be concentrated than graduates who were proficient at that time. Uh, research question three asks how college uh, outcomes of CD concentrators compared with samplers and non-participants. Uh, uh, as Megan just uh, I uh, mentioned this, we were comparing like similar group of CTE concentrators and uh, sampler non-participants. So we found that, uh, so after all this uh, student characteristics and school characters were adjusted for, concentrators in both states uh, had lower overall college enrollment. However, the lower 
uh, rates among concentrators were evident only for four-year colleges, where they enrolled at a rate of uh, 8 to 16 percentage points below uh, that of similar samplers and non-participants. Uh, the enrollment for two-year colleges, however, was 4 to 7 percentage points higher for concentrators than for similar samplers and non-participants. Uh, in both states, uh, concentrators were uh, between 5 to 12 percentage points less likely to attain a four-year bachelor's degree, then similar samplers and non-participants. And the concentrators were one to two percentage points more likely to attain an associate degree than similar samplers and non-participants. Uh, in Minnesota, we also found that concentrators uh, were two percent points more likely to attain a certificate uh, than similar samplers and non-participants. The last research question, uh, compare like how the employment and the earnings of uh, outcomes for these two group students. Uh, in both states, we found that concentrators were more likely than uh, similar samplers and non-participants to be employed during the first five years after graduation. In Indiana, the employments during the first five years after high school graduation were three to five percent points higher for concentrators than for similar samplers and non-participants. In uh, Minnesota, the employments for concentrators in the first five years after high school at graduation were two to four percentage points higher for concentrators. Uh, lastly, in both states, uh, concentrators had higher annual earnings than similar samplers and non-participants. Uh, during the first five years after graduation. And so in Indiana, the differences were uh, between $1,100 to $1,300 uh, annually. Uh, and in Minnesota, that difference is about uh, $1,200 to $2,400. These are all, uh, I, I should say, these are all $2013. So maybe in today's dollar a month, that should be a little bit higher than that. So I will now turn it back to Megan to discuss some of the limitations of our study and implications. Thanks, Yanmei. Um, so the study does have a few limitations that we wanted to point out um, that would be helpful to keep in mind when interpreting these study findings. Um, first, we were able to examine college credit attainment in Minnesota only. Uh, this outcome was not available in the data we received from Indiana. Second, we did limit our focus to high school graduates so that we could assign um, the, the graduates to CTE classifications based on their full high school curricula. Uh, this may mask other effects of being a CTE concentrator if high school graduation rates um, differ based on CTE classification status. Um, third, our matching approach relied on identifying students who had similar observable characteristics, um, that is the characteristics that were available in the data re we received. Um, the matched students could differ in other unobserved ways um, that also could have implications for uh, masking some findings. Um, also, we were not able to match all concentrators and explorers to a similar sampler or non-participant um, because we were really looking for those students who are similar on uh, other observable characteristics. So our match rate was fairly high in Indiana, 91% uh, um, were we were able to match. Um, in Minnesota, it was a little bit lower. So uh, the findings may not generalize to all uh, high school graduates. And then finally, our findings uh, about the effects of being a CTE concentrator are limited to the first five years um, after high school graduation. And it may be the case that these findings uh, might change um, if we were able to look at, at longer term trajectories. For example, some of the earnings differences may start to disappear or reverse over a longer time period. And then we did identify several implications for our state partners and we'll have the opportunity shortly to hear more about these and some additional takeaways from one of our partners. Um, first, educators may want to explore why certain graduate and high school characteristics were associated with larger or smaller percentages of CTE concentrators uh, to identify potential sources of inequitable participation. Um, second, high school teachers and guidance counselors could use these findings to help inform students who are considering their course-taking options. 
And then third, um, we hope future research will expand on these findings in a couple of ways. Uh, first, to examine how the findings might vary for students who concentrated in different fields. And I did see Natalia had a question in the chat box about that. We were not able to disaggregate um, by field of study within the scope of this uh, research report, uh, but it's definitely an area of interest for, for us and for our partners in the future. Um, and then also to examine in future research whether these findings remain consistent or change as graduates move beyond that five-year mark after, after high school graduation. So I'll pause here to open it up to any questions about the study um, and these findings. Thanks, Megan. I, I think in the interest of time, we're just going to move to Troy's um, slides and then we'll come back to questions afterwards. But thank you okay. so much for the presentation. Great, thank you. And then um, just briefly, I wanted to mention if you're interested in engaging further, you can read the full report and appendices as well as some shorter summaries, including a, a four page brief, a one page snapshot and an infographic at the link shown here. Um, and then, of course, you're also welcome to reach out directly to Ian May or myself with any follow-up questions. We um, always love to hear from folks. Uh, for now, though, we're pleased to have one of our state partners here to share his thoughts. Um, so I'll turn it over to Troy now. Um, thanks so much. Thank you, Megan. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I think it's after, well, it's afternoon where I live. So I, uh, my name is Troy Haugen. I'm the Director of Career and College Readiness uh, at Lakes Country Service Cooperative. So we're one of the nine service cooperatives in Minnesota. Uh, in some of your states, they're called service agencies. In Minnesota, they're called service cooperatives. Um, my main responsibility here at Lakes Country is I administer the Federal Perkins Grant for 26 of our school districts. So CTE is the, is the work that I do. Um, I also do, we also do teacher preparation here, particularly. Um, for career technical education through our alternative teacher preparation program. Um, there's a variety of different things we also do here at, at Lakes Country, but our, our main responsibility is really to serve students, uh, is through serve schools and uh, through those ser that service to schools uh, you know, impact students. Um, there's a lot of things that I'd really uh, like to think about and kind of process and talk about um, that really have implications uh, from you know th this study. Uh, one of the first things when we processed and talked about this study a variety of different times is that that doesn't get captured, doesn't get talked about, is um, the, the sheer amount of dollars that could be saved for uh, our students, our concentrators, or any of our students that um, would enter the workforce perhaps a little bit earlier or enter the workforce without uh, a huge debt load, uh, student student debt load. Um, that I think is a it's, it's obviously not measurable by this study. However, that's a that's an opportunity to be really thinking about as uh, folks that are within the field, within a school system, um, within a administrative structure or within a, a counseling structure about how are we making sure we're messaging to students in a way that yes, granted perhaps that that $1,200 in Minnesota, that $1,200 to $2,400 um, increase for those, that, those CTE concentrators in the first five years of of, uh, of of earnings doesn't seem like a lot, but juxtaposed over the course of time with the lack of debt load um, is massively important to understand and to, and to contextualize and to think about. Um, oftentimes, I know where, where I live, so I'm in West Central Minnesota, um, halfway down the state from the north to the south, and in my office is in Fergus Falls, Minnesota. And most of our students that enter uh, a post-secondary program, a career technical or a, more of a trade type of career technical program, uh, if they do a post-secondary route, they will come out with zero debt and with a job. If they complete, they'll come out with zero debt and, and, and a job, even if they don't complete, to be honest with you, um, and make a very, 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 very livable wage. That is an incredibly important to think about that context in the bigger picture. When we have students that are going into uh, a four-year path, 
which of course we need four year path. We need people that to, to enter that four years. However, going to that four year path, exiting that four, four year and not becoming a completer or not having persistence in it, uh, it the, the debt load that these students are bringing on is incredibly, incredibly uh, unsustainable for students and really for our overarching system. So I think that's just something to really consider as we, as we really think about this in a bigger ecosystem. The other piece that um, if there's any friends from uh, Minnesota on this, on this webinar today, they, they've heard me talk about this over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, is I could speak for Minnesota, but I think it's probably generalizable um, across the United States, is that current technical education has a pretty big identity crisis. We talk about career and technical education like everybody knows exactly what we're talking about. But if I were to simply ask all 41 of you attendees or all 50 attendees that are on this group, including all the panelists, to give me a succinct definition of what career and technical is, I'd probably get 50 different definitions. Um, and that's a little bit problematic. I, I have, as I said, I have 26 school districts across my, my consortia. And I have a lot of courses and a lot of programs that look and smell like CTE, but really are not career and technical. And I have a lot of cor courses that really aren't called career and technical, but because of a lot, because of licensure issues or other complex types of systematic things um, are not categorized as CTE courses. We have to be thinking about really what is career and technical education. It's not just about those technical skills. It's that juxtaposition of academic and technical content. It's, it's career development, career awareness. It is, um, it is all of those things. It's, it's getting that work experience uh, in, a, in an academic and a technical perspective too, getting that, that placement uh, in some way, shape or form. It is, it is not life skills. It's not quote unquote soft skills. That drives me nuts because it implies it's easy. It's, uh, it's, it's employability skills. It is all of these things. It's leadership. Um, it's tied to business and industry. It's tied to high skill, high wage, in demand careers. And we have to somehow find a better way to, to identify and strengthen our programming. Because I sometimes wonder if we're, again, making a legacy program or thinking about things in a legacy perspective, just because we've always done it that way. Um, I, 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 um, I've pushed really hard on my consortium teachers to say, if it, if it does not fit into a high skill, high wage in demand industry sector, you can call it career and technical, and it might fit the definition, but it really isn't doing our students a full amount of justice if they're going into a pathway that leads that way. Um, how are we really thinking about those in a bigger picture? Because it's our, our jobs as, as, as education isn't fully about fulfilling a workforce need, but we're not doing our due diligence if we're sending students into, a, into, into long term uh, exit into a workforce that isn't there for them. Um, so I think that how are we defining CTE? How are we supporting career and technical in our schools and in our region? And um, can we do a better job about that? Um, do, do our school administrators understand what it is? Do our school administrators still call it vocational because vocational was right for the time that it was there, but it's not what it is now. Um, do we have the right infrastructure in place? Because I would argue that oftentimes we don't. Um, and the, 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 another huge thing that I've thought, I keep continuing to think about and talking about is that, are we, and I ask teachers this all the time, are we preparing students for our future as adults, or are we preparing students for their future? Um, 
because uh, we oftentimes say that we're preparing for their future, but we then revert to back whatever is more uh, comfortable for us. The question I ask my business teachers are, is how many of your, how many of my school districts um, are still teaching keyboarding? Um, and as particularly as a part of a career and technical education program. Um, and, and I know my, my, my colleague from the Department of Education and Business is, is on, this, on this Zoom with me, with us today. And I'm, I'm hoping he's chuckling when I'm, when I'm talking about this. Um, and, there, and we have very, not very many. I don't think I have any that are in nine through 12 anymore. But five years ago when I asked that question, there were still quite a few. And most of them are teaching it in the earlier grades, in the elementary, late elementary, early to mid to late elementary. And my question, and my next question is, is how many do you think will, how many of your students in the elementary do you think will actually have a keyboard when they go into the workforce? And teachers are saying, well, everybody will just have a, still have a keyboard. And I think, hmm, I don't think so. I have six-year-olds, twin six-year-old boys that have yet to use a keyboard. Um, be, and I don't, except in school for the applications and programs that are only education-based. I, I, I think, are we, again, but, and they're being forced to do those, use that keyboard because that's the only path that our teachers thought they needed to do. So again, are we preparing kids for our future or are we preparing kids for their future? And that's a really hard question to ask. Uh, and sometimes we have to just ask kids um, and make sure we're also in, including our workforce. That's the requirement for Perkins is how are we, in, how are we uh, in integrating that work? Um, and then I think high school, high wage in demand. Um, how are we? How are we connecting to high skill, high wage, and demand? And are we? Are these careers or are these jobs? Uh, I've gone away from using jobs. Um, I still say it sometimes. I, I, I catch myself using the words jobs um, because our, our goal should be careers. Uh, how are we preparing students for long term sustainable careers? That doesn't mean that they're going to have the same job their entire time. But how do we prepare students to enter a workforce that they can be, um, be have a livable wage, they can, they can have mobility for what they want to be able to do and live their life the way they want to. Um, we, are, we keep hearing about this workforce that is just so incredibly tight. But we also, I can also tell you, give you just as many stories of workforce, of employers that are not having problems getting, uh, becoming full employed, fully employed, because they're being thoughtful about how they're hiring. And also, employee, employer, employees are moving to their, their places of employment because they see the connections between the two of them. So how can we see these bigger pictures? Frankly, work-based learning is that connection right now for students. I have uh, about 40 candidates in our alternative teacher preparation program in a work for the work-based learning endorsement in Minnesota. And a lot of them right now are, are teaching in special ed programs or in uh, alternative, uh, alternative learning center programs. They are stuck in a mental model sometimes of putting their students in entry-level positions constantly. And I say, sometimes don't you, you might have to do that. However, there's also opportunities to learn about and think about those for those students to move more towards, okay, if you're in an entry-level position, how does that entry-level position turn into a career? How, is that, how does that current job turn into a career? So I, I think you've probably heard me talk <laughs> long enough, but I, I just really honestly, I, 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 there's, there's so much to unpack in this, in this study and I appreciate, um, I appreciate the study a significant amount um, and, and, and thank you all for, for the work and thank you for listening to my, my rant a little bit and, uh, and uh, keep up the good work, everybody.
Well, Troy, I wouldn't call it a rant. I think uh, hearing uh, the on the ground context is really meaningful. Um, and so really glad to have you um, here with us. Um, I'm going to invite Megan and Jean May to come back on and we'll have, I know we had a few questions come in. I'll start with those, but also welcome um, those of you who are attending. If other questions come up for you or you have a comment, um, please go ahead and share them. We'd love to engage with you. Um, so we had a few questions related um, to students who are receiving special education or integrated services or IEPs. Um, so there was one question about um, whether we could speak to data comparing concentrator students with IEPs and those without. And then another question for those who receive special education or integrated services, are data available regarding the nature of the services that students received in the context of CTE? I, I can answer that. Uh, so for special education um, services, the simple answer is no, we don't have that level of data. Um, so what data we have is just an indicator in, in I think in both states, there's an indicator of whether the student uh, would receive special education or not. Um, and we don't have like uh, more detailed data on the kind of uh, services or uh, the services they receive as part of the CDE. Um, Megan, I might ask you the next question, which was um, was a question of what uh, what did Indiana attribute the doubling in concentrator participation to? I don't know if um, you have any insights into that through conversations with our stakeholders or you know any thoughts on that. Um, yeah, a little bit. We were able to share these findings with our stakeholders in Indiana um, a little while back. And I think the, the big takeaway for them is that they're, they've really um, been very intentional in recent years about giving increased attention to CTE, um, CTE pathways. Uh, they're during the course of study, it wasn't quite uh, implemented yet, but they had done a lot of work to sort of redefine career pathways um, over this period of time and uh, think uh, carefully about some of the issues that Troy is raising as well about alignment of, of areas and uh, meaningful types of CTE uh, and to really try to rebrand and, and make it um, an attractive uh, pathway or set of pathways for students. So I think um, some of those things that are sort of coming to fruition now in terms of uh, policy implementation uh, were sort of in development and were starting to be reflected in, in sort of the culture in Indiana over that period of time. Thanks, Megan. Um, there was also a question about what policies or practices um, may contribute to more students in Minnesota becoming CTE concentrators and maybe we can ask that to both Troy and to Dine, because you guys both might have reflections on the data or the lived experience um, as well. Sure. So I, I would real I would not really compare the percentages between Indiana and the Minnesota. Uh, first of all, the definitions are so different, right? So in Indiana, we define a concentrator within a single pathway which Indiana has somewhere around the 60 to 70 pathways. Well, in, the, well, in uh, Minnesota, we divide more broadly, right? Within like each career field, with six, seven career field. So that's one thing. Another thing is the definition of the Minnesota, it's 150 hours, while in Indiana, it's a six uh, like semester uh, credits, so they are not really comparable. So I would suggest uh, not to compare any like percentage directly between those two states. Yeah, right. I might maybe I can reinterpret it, the question and maybe rather than more as comparing Minnesota Indiana, I wonder if you might have some perspective on um, are there policies or practices that help more students find that concentration pathway or kind of how do you what do you see in terms of the programs that you support in terms of um, what policies or practices help students to find those kind of alignments? Yeah, I think uh, that's a that's a great question. Um, and I think part of it is becoming 
it, it, I think there's a dual answer to it. Well, there's probably more than a dual answer to it. So part of um, living in a very rural area, it becomes difficult for, for some of our programs to become, for some of our students to become concentrators. I have, I serve two school districts that, I, want, I serve one school district that graduated two seniors last year. Uh, I think has uh, 10 seniors this year. So literally can jump from two seniors to 10 seniors in one year. Still an incredibly small school district. School district, and I have another school district in my consortia that graduates 300 students every year. But still, in the grand scheme of things, in in is a small. That's my smallest to my largest. Uh, it's very difficult for my school district of of uh, my tiny school district that graduates anywhere from two to 10, uh, 10 students to ever get a concentrator. Um, uh, and yet it's not difficult for my, my largest school district to get all kinds of concentrators just because of the opportunity for course offerings. That's also part of the reason why our definition of concentrator is very different in Minnesota. Um, and why it's an hours based is because, I mean, if the joke is, policy joke is, is every state thinks that they're, they're the most local controlled state. Um, but you know, there's I have school districts that are trimester schools. We have school we have school districts that are semester schools. So to say count uh, count uh, uh, a concentrator based on a semester doesn't work because I have a school one school district right next to each other might be a trimester and a semester, and you can't count them that way. So that's why we count them in hours. Um, so it, it it becomes more of a practical piece. Uh, in some ways. And on the other hand, it becomes almost a responsibility of, uh, for, of people like me that are uh, consortia coordinators, perhaps, to say, to push on districts and teachers to say, how are you creating in a broad-based program, uh, how are we creating pathways to careers and not a smattering of courses that don't lead to a student becoming a concentrator? Uh, when I, I, I've seen school districts that will do these smatterings where the teacher will be teaching six courses, six preps, and will teach in six different, really six different pathways. Um, and will never, never, uh, uh, a student will never be able to concentrate versus if we simply just narrow that focus a little bit, student can concentrate really quickly. Um, so I think it's, it's a combination of a couple of different things. An interesting question, Troy, that I think builds on that, and we'll bring in our researchers too, which was about um, whether there was clustering among certain schools or communities in some of the outcomes. Um, and so the individual is wondering about how the programs of study may be aligned to the CTE programs in post-secondary institutions and the labor market and how that influences student outcomes. Um, so would welcome your reflections on maybe were there opportunities for additional um, research and explorations in this area. Um, but I think, um, Troy, I think you have some relationships in terms of how you think about labor market needs with your um, school, so maybe can speak to that. So maybe I'll ask Megan and Jean May first to respond to that question about locale, and then Troy can jump in. Yeah, I'm happy to speak to this a little bit, and you may feel free to add as well. Um, from a research standpoint, this is a, a large but very important undertaking. Um, the alignment sort of between labor market uh, and field of study uh, requires um, data on labor market needs at a, a local level, uh, which can be very difficult to uh, uh, get access to and, and kind of quantify. Um, there's also a lot of local disaggregation of data of the statewide data that needs to go into that to kind of match things up. So um, this is an area that's sort of been understudied so far, I think in part due to just the challenges with really um, gathering and, and uh, digging into data at the level needed. Um, but definitely something that uh, is worth pursuing and hopefully will continue to be uh, a growing area in the field. So. Um, I wish we had more to say from the research standpoint, but I, I know Troy has a lot to contribute um, from the practitioner standpoint on this one. Yeah, that's a it's a really um, yeah it's a, it's it's a it's a it's a conundrum. Um, 
we have massive systems in place. We have uh, a, a K-12 system in place. We have a higher education system in place, which are massive systems that are not easily move, movable. Um, so in Minnesota, our consortia, our Perkins Consortium model requires a at least one school district and one post-secondary, two-year post-secondary. Well, I have 26 school districts and uh, three college campuses of a two-year college. Um, this the two-year college that I that I work with is is really pretty nimble and responsive to labor market needs. But there's also this uh, other component to the to to all of this that becomes really complex is that two-year systems also have to be financially responsible and financially stable. Well, so does K-12, but there's a funding source behind K-12 called the state government that, that generally will put money into the system. State government in Minnesota typically is, is, is it decreased its investment in, in post-secondary in Minnesota significantly over the last 20 years. Um, and their only revenue source is typically you know, increasing tuition, which there's that pressure to not do that. So what happens oftentimes is there is a little bit of a disconnect between secondary programs and post-secondary programs, particularly in career and technical, because the, the really popular and necessary post-secondary technical programs have become more non-credit-based programs and more, um, more, 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 more paper service types of programs or um, uh, their short-term certificate types of programs or even non-certificate programs uh, uh, in, in Minnesota. They're, um, uh, I can't even think of what they're called right now. I, for some reason, it just went out of my head. Surprise, surprise. Um, uh, customized training, I'm sorry. They're customized training programs. So for example, the college campus that I work on doesn't have a welding program anymore, a four credit welding program because there was, there was not a demand for the four credit welding program because credits aren't necessary in the workforce. The credentials are what's necessary in the workforce. The certification is what ne what's necessary for the workforce. Credits cost increase that cost of the certification program. So if you circumvent the credit process and just go to the certification program, it becomes a customized training program. So, and customized training programs aren't bound by an academic year. You can do customized training programs at any given time. And it is, so it becomes really a weird uh, disconnect. Yes, the programs are there, but you can't align a secondary program to a customized training program, even though the customized training program is, is held at the post-secondary, but it's not a four credit, it's not a credit bearing program. So, yeah, and that doesn't necessarily get to the question specifically, but it creates this really odd conundrum because it appears as though that there's not a labor market connection, but there is between secondary and post-secondary. Uh, it's just the way to become a demand. We do have two areas that are that do have a pretty significant disconnect, and that's healthcare on the secondary side. We don't really have any healthcare programs, and that's our number one labor market need. And we have all kinds of post-secondary pro programs. We have one tiny, tiny little uh, secondary uh, healthcare program, um, and out of our 26 districts, and then all of this plethora of post-secondary programs. And then we have a plethora of ag food natural resources programs and really no tech true ag food natural resources programs that are post-secondary. But those again, the AFNR type of program is really nuanced because if you look at the NAICS data and the SOC data uh, in, in labor market terms, they're not well-defined. So it gets complex again. They, a, a, a AFNR student in a post, in a secondary program is, can be a welder, can be a transportation person that can go to become a, a mechanic. And so can go to all of these, the career will, it doesn't have to go to the green area. But they can go to all of these other areas. So there's a, there's the, there's a philosophical kind of disconnect. It, it just gets to be really complex and weird and, but it's really our, our ultimate goal again is, is how do we get students into a play, into a path that they can become successful in a career?
and we just have to navigate the the, the other stuff. Um, thanks, Troy. Definitely lots of partners, lots of needs. Um, I, I think that speaks to that very well. Um, one final question. We had a question for Troy about where you might invest funds, like two to three areas to increase consideration of CTE participation before high school. So we've talked a lot about the pathways up, um, but wondering if you have any thoughts on um, where there might be some strategic investment um, or opportunities there. Ah, oh, love that question. Um, so I live in the policy world too. And when you live in the policy world, the first thing you're taught is, is what's the problem? Um, you have you first have to ask what the problem is, and I would honestly say the our problem is is the identity crisis of all of this, and we have to first functionally invest in fixing that identity crisis around career and technical, and it's not amongst the students, it's amongst the adults. So, just to, to say even before high school, it's actually how do we provide high levels of professional development, whatever it is. To, to, to making our, to, uh, to getting a better functionally, a functional system of really truly understanding what career and technical is in the entire ecosystem of E12 education. Whether it's a kindergarten teacher, whether it's a 12th grade math teacher, whether it's, uh, whether it's the counselor, whether it's the, the principal, the superintendent, whether it's the, the doesn't matter. And also a system of all getting, uh, Legis legislators to understand this, get in the entire world to understand what this really is, because it's not vocational, it's not dirty, it's not anything. It's what makes the world goes round, go round. March of 2020, we quickly figured out what the necessary workforce was, and it was career and technical. Um, but how, how quickly we've forgotten, too. Um, I think that really has to be so if I had a magic wand and a money tree, that's probably where I would go first because until we really get a better understanding, until I quit hearing, yeah, that's great for everybody else's kid, but not for mine. That's where we have to start. Well, thank you, Troy, um, Jimé and Megan. Um, really appreciate you guys um, talking to us all about CTE and kind of reflecting together on um, two states, um, but a common theme um, and investment um, in this work. So um, thank you guys for joining us and thank you to our attendees as well. Um, just briefly, we would really love your feedback. Um, so as you're exiting the webinar, um, if you leave, it should pop up in your browser, but you can also click the link. Um, but your feedback is really helpful uh, in helping us to consider your interests um, and future work. Next slide. We would also encourage you to follow us on Twitter at Realm Midwest, um, and you can sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date on additional resources and events. Uh, we have one final event of 2021 coming up in early November on networked improvement communities, um, also built out from the same research partnership that I highlighted earlier. So um, by joining us uh, on that newsletter and on Twitter, you can find more information about that webinar as well as some other resources that will be coming out. Um, so again, um, thank you to our guests, to our attendees. Um, we really appreciate your time today and hope this was a meaningful time together.